Thank you very much, Barry. I will. Uh, you yes. Well, Let I would like. I would like to to start thanking you uh -huh. and paying tribute to you for the strong legacy that you are leaving with all of us and how much you have taught us. You have really helped us become better in our communication. So I would like another round of applause for Barry <laughs> before we uh, we start speaking about about NATO. Well, many of you may wonder. What is NATO doing this at this communications uh, conference, at this summit? And I think that Barry and Richard decided to invite NATO to speak to you today because we are modernizing our communications constantly. And we have been modernizing our public communications for many years. But what has really been a game changer in our external communications is how we have improved evaluation and measurement. And this is thanks to many of you in the room who are working with us to make our evaluation stronger, including AMIC, of course. So before I will explain to you how NATO is competing in a very contested information space, I would like to share a few things about what NATO is all about, because this is a great opportunity for me we have 41 countries represented in the room, and there are so many misperceptions about NATO, including in my home country, Spain. So I would like to remind all of you the fact that NATO is a political military organization that was created in 1949 to keep peace after two devastating world wars. And for almost 70 years, NATO's purpose has remained the same, to preserve peace and to prevent conflict. We have 29 allies, 29 countries that are bounded by common values. I heard a lot of values, speaking about values this morning. Well, the key of NATO is really values and also solidarity. NATO is not an offensive organization. NATO is a defensive organization. And what is very powerful is the fact that we are providing security to almost one billion people in Europe and in North America. And I give you a figure, 94% of the people living in a European Union country actually live in a NATO country. So it's, it's huge. I would like to say a few things about our collective defense clause, which we call Article 5, which is at the heart of what we do in NATO. That means that an attack on one ally is an attack on us all. And this clause has only been activated once. It has been activated in response to the September 11 attacks on the United States. The fact that we activated this clause led to NATO's biggest operation ever, our operation in Afghanistan that now is a training mission. So we are a collective defense organization, but we also deal with crisis management and with cooperative security. So our operations and missions are very diverse. We have been for almost two decades in Kosovo providing security to all the ethnic communities. We have been supporting the United Nations efforts to fight pirates of the Horn of Africa. We are working now very, very closely with the European Union to tackle illegal migration, and we are training security forces in Iraq. This is just to give you a picture of what NATO has been doing and is doing today. And the reason that NATO has been so successful in these past seven decades is our ability to adapt to new security challenges and to change as the world itself has changed. And we, as communicators, have been adapting to these changes, and we have been become more deliberate in the way we communicate. So now I would like to share with you how NATO sees the current contested information space, which is very much linked to the security challenges we face. You will all agree with me that the security environment has changed radically since 2014, and I'm using 2014 because this was the last time a NATO speaker uh, addressed this conference. Since 2014, we have seen a more assertive Russia. 
We have seen the rise of ISIS and the rise of terrorism. We have experienced an increase in cyber attacks. We have seen also nuclear proliferation growing as a growing threat. And we have also seen new and complex challenges in the information space. We heard this morning about disinformation, propaganda, hybrid tactics in the information space. And it's true that these are not new. But what is new is how these phenomena are exploiting the speed and the sophistication of new technologies. Alex was speaking this morning about fake news. Well, if this is systematic, the way we look at this in NATO is that if fake news are systematic, they are not fake news, they are disinformation. And the aim of disinformation is not to convince. The aim of disinformation is to confuse, to deepen divides, to undermine the trust in our democracies, in our democratic institutions, and to ultimately prevent action. It's a fact that disinformation campaigns are growing in sophistication, intensity, reach, and impact. But this is not the only challenge we face every day. There is so much noise out there, and this for NATO and many of the organizations represented here today is a huge challenge because our audiences get so much noise. So why should they be listening to NATO? We don't sell a sexy product. We are projecting the importance of security, and this is not very tangible, so it's very difficult. So how are we cutting through the noise in NATO? We are doing this by communicating with confidence. Let me share a video with you that captures the essence of NATO today. We saw the video this morning, so it should. No, we go back to the video. Jestem pierwszą kobietą w Polsce, która lata na samolotem pojemnym. Nazywają mnie Witch, ale nie jestem aż taka zła. Obecnie latam Migiem 29. Kiedy zakładam hełm i idę do samolotu, to wiem, że nie mam taryfy ulgowej. Ten samolot po prostu nie wybacza błędów, czy to kobiecie, czy mężczyźnie. Wszyscy jesteśmy pilotami. Jestem częścią NATO Air Defense Quick Reaction Alert. Jesteśmy dumni z tego, że możemy osłaniać i chronić naszych sojuszników z NATO. Bycie pilotem było czymś tak niewiarygodnym i nieprawdopodobnym, że tak sobie pomyślałam, że jak już mierzyć, to mierzyć wysoko i nie ma rzeczy niemożliwych. Nie sądzę, żebym była inspiracją dla dziewczyn, aczkolwiek jeśli tak jest, uważam, że niemożliwe nie istnieje i każda z nas, jeżeli będzie tylko wytrwała i wytrwale dążyła do celu, to go po prostu osiągnie. Since 2014, NATO has fundamentally adapted the way it plans and the way it conducts its external communications. We have widened the diversity of our content to appeal to a range of audiences. And part of this new approach includes a stronger emphasis on evaluation. Our alliance is responding to a contested information space with what we call in NATO two A's and three C's. So the two A's start for awareness, and analysis, this is at the heart of what we do. We are in NATO monitoring the new cycle 24 seven. We analyze on a daily, on a weekly, on a monthly basis, which narratives are gaining traction across the media spectrum. We analyze trends in the information environment, and this brings insights that allow us to adjust our messaging and also our communications approaches. The three C's stand for counter-messaging, communicating with confidence, and coordination. By counter-messaging, what I mean is that we don't engage in a tit-for-tat, especially when we deal with this information. We don't counter propaganda with propaganda. We do it using facts and figures. We do that always keeping in mind our values and being transparent. Communicating with confidence is very important for us because we are always prepared to explain who we are, what we are doing, and why. And in the long run, what we have really learned is that credibility is our most important asset to communicate to our different audiences. If we 
lose credibility, we lose it all. Coordination is the main target of disinformation. So we are more effective if we try to communicate with one voice. And I tell you, NATO is a very complex organization because we have so many different internal stakeholders. So coordination is very hard and we are making great progress in, in improving our com com coordination. We coordinate constantly. We, are, we coordinate at NATO headquarters in Brussels. We coordinate with our civilian colleagues. We coordinate with our um, partners with the European Union and we also, for example, coordinate within the global coalition to defeat ISIS because we are also a member. So we build stronger partnerships because we know that we are stronger if we are united. This A2 C3 approach is helping us to focus more and to innovate. So how is NATO innovating? And I will come to Alex now because in recent years we have taken a more structured and innovative approach to our communications, having evaluation and measurement at its core. And we have made great progress in these areas. This morning, Alex was speaking about establishing smart objectives. That's very important. This is something that at the beginning, a few years ago, we were not doing. Very clear, very simple communications objectives that we can measure. We understand much better what audiences, what our audiences know think, feel, and do. We are designing audience-driven communication strategies. So our main target, keeping in mind, is audience. What do the audience think and what do they need? Integrating communications throughout the NATO family. As I told you, this is a complex exercise because we are many different stakeholders. And reinforcing the planning and evaluation functions. We have adopted a campaign approach to communicate in a more effective way primarily to our home audiences, the citizens of our 29 member states. At the same time, we know that we have also other audiences. We have audiences in our partner countries. NATO has 40 partner countries, including Colombia, is our newest uh, partner country, which is also represented here, and also audiences beyond. And a campaign approach may not be new in the private sector, but I can tell you in NATO, it's really a big step towards innovation. And we are working very closely with Alex. We are trying to uh, adopt the UK, well, we have adopted the UK Oasis model and the UK is really a big mentor and is helping us a lot. We are telling NATO story to our home audiences because in an alliance of democracy, the support of our public is very, very important. And by emphasizing the need for more security, NATO, I have to say it, wants to maintain and to increase public support, especially to people, young people, who don't know much about NATO. Our hashtag, you saw it in the pre here, is we are NATO. We are boosting our digital capacity so that we can reach, in a more effective way, young audiences. We produce videos in-house and we post on digital platforms all the time our content, you have seen it and you will see it is modern and dynamic, often showing, as I was saying, the less known side of NATO, the military, but also the non-military side of NATO, such, what NATO, such as what NATO is doing in, in the area of training, how we empower women, the work that we are also conducting is important that takes into account different voices. So, for example, we have many different senior officials active on social media, in Turkish, in Dutch, in German. So we have very, very, very different uh, voices that are constantly active, active in trying to, in, to, to engage in social media. And we constantly, as I said at the beginning, assess the impact of our traditional and social media platforms. As an example, I would tell you that according to Tree Diplomacy, the Secretary General of NATO is one, Jens Stoltenberg, He's the former Prime Minister of Norway. He's one of the most engaged and active leaders of an international organization on social media. And from modest beginnings, we have built a robust presence on Facebook and Twitter. And in early 2017, we joined Instagram. Now, over 1,000 posts later, the account has 76 
thousand followers. Compared to other organizations, this is, this is very modest, but for NATO, this is, this is big, because we have really uh, moved uh, a lot forward. And we have an average of 1,100 new followers every week. Instagram is the fastest growing NATO platform today. In 2018, we started experimenting with series of Instagram stories to take the audience behind the scenes and show them NATO stories as they happen. So we posted on Instagram, the first feature was, story was with Angelina Jolie. She came to NATO headquarters in January and she came in her capacity of special envoy for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. She came to discuss with NATO what more we can do together to prevent sexual and gender-based violence in conflict areas where NATO has a role. And we had a lot of success. In a few hours, we had over 80,000 followers and unique users. But we also listen to our audience. We want to engage with them. So here is another example. A few months ago, we shared on Instagram a picture of two women from Poland, fighter pilots on their planes. And we saw that the picture got a huge uh, impact, so we got immediately 8,000 likes, and we realized the potential of this. So we went to her, we went to one of the two women, one was the first ever female fighter pilot in Poland, and we did the video that you just saw. This video is the best performing video of NATO in 2018. So this shows that having different voices is, is paying off, and the direct engagement is becoming more and more important. And it also shows that we can be more effective if we integrate our communications efforts. What I'm going to talk to you now about integration is something that is very, very important for me because I have really contributed to improving internal integration within NATO. And to give you a sense, in NATO we have fully integrated communications in the policy debate. And this is something that was not happening in 2013, for example. There is not a single policy decision that doesn't include communications advice. We contribute to shape the policy decisions every day. To give you an example, we travel every day with the Secretary General. So we are fully embedded in policy discussions and we fit into them all the time at all levels. At the same time, we use communications to actively support policy objectives. It goes without, without saying. And we design overarching communications guidance that we build together with our different stakeholders, and then we share with them for guidance. And we go into more details by elaborating integrated communications plan that use all the communications tools at our disposal to have a proactive communications approach. And again, we assess. And so we have a wide range of evaluation tools and services at our disposal, including some of the companies represented in the room today, we use Kantar for mainstream media and analysis, monitoring and analysis. We use Brownwatch, Social Bakers, and Econosquare for digital and social media. We use Teletracks for monitoring global broadcast. But we also rely on our internal resources, the brain that also Alex was talking about, because it's very important to have also an internal capacity to conduct monitoring and analysis. And we, as we embed the campaign approach into NATO communications, we are also integrating our evaluation tools and practices across the NATO family insights. The front line of our daily assessment is media monitoring and analysis. And this fits our communications and political decision making processes all the time. We have a small internal team that monitors the news cycle and also looks at longer trends and we don't stop <laughs> assessing. But we also know that we have to, to look at the big picture and maybe this is one of the most interesting things for you because we are right now in NATO developing what we call an integrated information environment assessment capability. We started last year focusing on the coverage of our 
deployment, military deployment to the eastern part of our alliance, to the Baltic states and to Poland, and the deployment of four multinational battalions to the eastern part of NATO attracted a lot of media attention. But the attention was not always friendly, as you can imagine. So here you can find one way we approach this. This video shows one of the two integrated approach, approaches we develop. Firstly, we integrated our communications plans. We develop all together sol soldiers and civilians. We work together on the same objectives, on the same evaluation uh, matrices, and this is the first time we did this, um, using the same channels and tactics. Secondly, we integrated our communications assessments, analyzing the trends and relying on many different inputs from the nations that are hosting our troops, from the nations that are providing the troops to our military commands. And this integrated approach is helping us since this is now one year that we are deployed now in the eastern part of the Alliance. It's helping us understand the space into which our messages are landing, and it gives us a better insight into the impact of our own communications. This is also useful because Knowing where this information is coming from means that we can set the record straight whenever necessary and also ensures that we don't get distracted by noise. Let me tell you a little bit more about our information environment assessment capability that we are developing to look at the big picture. And this is about assessing the impact of our own communications but also assessing what others are saying about NATO. What are they? What, do we have any hostile narratives? If so, how do we react to them? And so this is something that is a very complex undertaking, but we are confident that we are on the right path and we are looking at how we can integrate new technological developments to see how we can refine and improve the way we assess the information environment. So we are keeping up within our resources. I would like to conclude by saying that Today, NATO is an institution that continues to stand for crucial and enduring values, and this also applies to our public communications. This is really key. We know that we must remain flexible, innovative, and cooperative. And this is why measurement and evaluation, very, is so important, because it shows us if we are reaching the right people, if our messages are resonating with them, and it helps us understand what people know about NATO, what they think about our work. And as we said at the beginning, in a contested information environment where the world is changing so fast, we need evaluation, we need structured evaluation because this helps us measure the interests of our citizens in NATO, keep an alliance that is credible and increases the trust of our audiences that have in our organization. So flexibility, adaptability, and unity. These are the key principles that are guiding the work of NATO today, and these are also the principles that are driving our public communications today in NATO. Thank you very much. And so we have um, an interpretation of your um, excellent presentation. Thank you. So I'm looking for the first hand in the air, please. Um, the middle row uh, here, please. 
name and company, yeah. please. Richard Bailey, PRplace.com. There is a paradox here, though. We, we teach and train. One of the principles of evaluation is to align comms objectives to organizational objectives. If the objective of the organization, as you describe it, is that nothing should ever happen, and you've thankfully been very successful mm -hmm. in nothing happening, how do comms objectives serve nothing happening when you've described lots and lots of comms happening? Yes, well, one of the core uh, missions of, nation, of NATO is to prevent conflict, as I was saying, which doesn't mean that we are not doing anything. We are increasing, for example, our deterrence, and the uh, whole aim of deterrence is to prevent conflict. So you need to communicate in a, in a proactive way what that means and the fact that we are doing that in a, in, a, in a defensive way, not in an offensive way. And there is a lot of disinformation out there about our increased deterrence activities, for example, in the eastern part of our alliance. So it's very important to communicate and to be uh, assertive about what uh, we are doing. So it's not that we are not doing anything. We are doing a lot to preserve peace and we are doing a lot to increase our deterrence and to, uh, to, to create the conditions so that there is, there, is, there is peace and there is no war. So it's, you need to be very active in the communication sphere to support those policy objectives. At the same time, as I said, NATO is very active in crisis management and cooperative security. We are doing a lot to project stability to our partner nations because also as part of preventing conflict is making your partners stronger because then we will be more secure in NATO. So this is also about taking action. It's not that NATO is not doing anything. NATO is doing a lot and you need to communicate that in a factual, incredible way and also in a, in a transparent way. Good question. Thank you. I'm looking for another question. Um, come down here with a microphone, please. Our Chinese colleague, yeah. Uh, my name is Ong from uh, Maverick in Indonesia. Okay. Now, um, micro-targeting uh, is a great way for, you know, whatever powers to destabilize, to stir up hate, etc. Is NATO seeing this? And, you know, what are you doing about it? What is it? Micro-targeting of, hmm? or, you know, micro-targeting, a bit like micro, what Cam Micro-targeting? Yeah, yeah. What okay. do you mean? Like what Cambridge Analytica was doing. They, we are they, not targeting. They get, they get so specific. They know the, virtually the psychology of the people there. We are and not And that's doing a great way to, to, to stir up hate, etc. Is NATO seeing this in, in some of the areas you operate? And if you are seeing it, what are you doing about it? Well, we are not, if, if you are speaking of psychological operations, if this is what you have in mind, we don't conduct as an organization uh, psychological operations in peace time. We are not collecting uh, data or if this is what, what you mean, we are, yeah, maybe it's not clear. Okay, well for us, for us data protection and to follow all the regulations, well, I can tell you that everything we do uh, both as an organization, but also in our communications activities, is always in line with the legal regulations uh, of, you know, international obligations and responsibilities. So that's, that's very important for us. And we have very, very strict rules. Mm. Thank you. Both as an international organization and, uh, yeah. I'd like to thank on your behalf, um, Carmen, for coming. Thank She's you. worked very hard on this presentation. Thank you.